talk to Neely, if you have any questions, and then we'll take a short break, about seven minute breaks, let you vape outside or whatever you need to do, <laughs> get some fresh air, drink water, and then we'll come back for Tongues of Heaven, directed by Anita Chang. So, um, I have a lot of questions for you, Neely, but first, does anybody have anything they want to ask first? You sure? Go ahead. Um, you mentioned something about your dad in Philadelphia. Is that, did you live there or did your father live there? Can you hear me? Can you talk about your father and living in Philadelphia? Can you share some stories or some insights? Well, my father was a hobo in the 30s and he rode the freights all over the country and did farm labor, all kinds of places, and became very friendly with a lot of people from various parts of the world. He moved to San Francisco in 1938, and his best friends were a, a very well-known watercolor artist named Don Kingman, who was originally from Hong Kong and lived in North Beach. And my mother and him would go out painting in Marin and down in the uh, coast of San Mateo. <clears throat> and then there was a, a Thai friend named Kumit Chandralong, who was a, um, from the Royal House of Siam. And he was an old friend of my father's too. And then there were a lot of uh, European Basque um, and um, French people also in North Beach at that time. So, he was, my parents were part of the North Beach scene up till Pearl Harbor, and then they had to leave. What I mostly learned from my father was this kind of internationalism, you know, and uh, uh, that was really great. Thanks, Neil. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned the film being comforted by literature, being comforted by poetry. Um, could you say more about that or share some more about that, especially yeah. in, in the recent months or years? That what game? Being comforted by poetry or being comforted by literature. Can you talk more about that? Well, simply, you know, I don't think being a creator, a creative person is. Uh, I'm not even sure what that is. I guess everybody is creative in their way, you know. But certainly if you have an artistic discipline and you focus on it, it does give you a, a relative sense of comfort, you know. You'd be hurt by the world, you go and you make a painting or you, you do a drawing or you sculpt the bowl or you uh, write a poem or you start a prose piece, you know. Obviously you're, you're confronting yourself, you're, and you're looking at the world through your own eyes and reinterpreting that world according to your own uh, intrinsic sense of self. Any other questions? Nobody. <laughs> yes, go ahead. So you mentioned like kind of converting to like technology if you were like how often was do you have like a ratio of like how often you write things like on paper versus like some sort of device? Can you talk about the percentage of how much you write on paper and how much you write on your phone or the computer? Well, that's interesting. Probably most of it. If you're a writer, if you're a poet, or I don't know how many here are poets and writers. Most of it you lose. Like you, I mean, you write it for yourself. You hear it in your own head. And you don't get it down on the computer, on the paper, or on anything else. It just goes in you and out you. For example, you could, for example, you could be walking on Waverly like I was a little while ago, 
and suddenly I'm, I'm thinking of Waverly Place in 1920 and this crowd of people and, and all that, and then bam, it's gone. And you know, could I have written that down? Probably, whatever the impression was. And uh, things leave you all the time. And I build what, you know, montages uh, in, in my head of things. And I'm very aware that they disappear on me. Um, so the words come and go. Uh, I probably do more on the uh, computer right now because uh, I've learned how to do voice recognition on the computer so I don't have to type. I just sit and I make sure the TV's off and nobody interrupts me and I can sit there and just speak into the computer and it writes the sentences down. Then of course you have to go through it and reorder, maybe uh, put in punctuation when it isn't there, sometimes it's not there. And some, sometimes some words are so ridiculously <laughs> interpreted by the computer than, than the way you spoke them. It also censors, like if you say fuck, it'll put an asterisk. <laughs> How the hell, did, you know, it's really amazing, it's a moral thing. And a year ago I was using it iPhone more for that, but then the mechanism isn't working as good, and I haven't had it fixed, so I'm spending more time on the computer. I don't write by hand that much anymore. My uh, fountain pens, not as much. I know one of your favorite poets is Lee Poe. Could you speak about Lee Poe and, and you know, give us some insight? Lee Poe, also called Lee Bai, there are other names, 750 A.D., probably one of the great, you know, I always do these numbers, maybe one of the 10 or 15 greatest uh, poets uh, on the planet uh, for all time, and very much recognizes so. And uh, probably as known for what he left out of the poems as what he put in the poems. Now that has a lot to do with what you see in, in all traditional, classical Chinese aesthetics. <clears throat> not, in, uh, not in the aesthetics of Mao or, or modernism in China, but traditionally that it's what's left out, it's what's suggested that is just as important as what's written there. So that a lot of times you see landscapes, seascapes, mountainscapes, and and they're not as filled in as in the Western tradition because they deliberately are trying to emphasize certain things and they feel you can fill it in yourself, you add to it. So Lipo is very terse and short. There's a lot of poems about being drunk. It was rice wine. A lot of poems about uh, friendship mainly with other writers. It was very important. And another, another great theme of, of traditional Chinese poetry is the idea of distance and loss. And some of the greatest poems of Li Po's and of other Chinese luminaries is the, the sense of being in exile. I was sent out by the emperor 2,000 miles to the borders to, to fight against the barbarians and I'll never come home again. So these great poems of of loss and longing. And beyond all that, Li Po became, and, and uh, both Japanese and Chinese poets became very important to the beat generation of poets. Um, this is interesting because right, at, right after the World War II, where Japan, of course, was so despised in America, uh, that just a few years later, there were these great writers uh, uh, Desai uh, is one who, who wrote uh, these words that were very, uh, made a big mark on the beat poets. Gary Snyder especially, his first book, Rip Rap, kind of leads toward that. There, there's the other great Chinese poet, Han Shan, uh, Cold Mountain is translated, and, and I'd say there's three or four translations right now today of his work. He was a monk who lived in a monastery off 
in the wilderness, and uh, it's very uh, beatnik-like, uh, his poetry. Uh, uh, very much uh, not admired by traditional Chinese um, cultural czars, if you will, you know, but very much uh, uh, a reflection of common people. Yes, go ahead, you can ask. Um, I really was taken with the way you described using the pen on paper, the sound, the kind of central aspect of it, or like carving into rock. And I was wondering if, um, kind of maybe in the same vein as another question, does that change the tone or the texture of your poetry? Um, and is, is it, do you write differently with the computer? Or that makes no difference at all, whatever the mechanism is, your words are coming, you know, in whatever vein. How the words come to you with writing with, for example, a fountain pen on paper and having that texture versus a computer. Could you speak about that? Sort of. <laughs> you know, you, 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 I, I, I'm con constantly aware of being greedy for new images, new words, for something that will astound me and hopefully other people, and then you write it, and, it's, and it, it seems wonderful the minute, minute you wrote it, and then it seems very common and sometimes not even good uh, once you put it down. I try to force the poem to be good, which could be very dangerous, but it, it means being as focused as you can be. And uh, like Lipo was, for example, to be very focused and I know with the fountain pen, I had this idea that the words are floating in the ink in the pen, and they're just waiting to be brought up, and they're actually there. The word good, the word bad, the word life, the word long, they're, they're just sitting right there, and, and they want to come out. And I know with the computer, I change into like a stone tablet. The only way I could reconcile myself to the computer was, well, it's a stone tablet, and I'm chiseling on it. And the way you do that is by tap, 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 you know. And I related it to the old typewriter I had, you know, uh, because it, there was nothing like the old Underwood and Royal typewriter, the tap, 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 tap. And I never, learned, I don't know about the rest of you, I never learned how to type. I used three fingers, but I'm extremely fast on the typewriter, and so I'm very fast on the computer too. But that's why most voice recognition allows me to be even faster, because my mind is moving. Uh, all the time. And then there's the idea that, that have you done too much? Do you need to do this? Is it necessary? I'm working on my selected poems that we're arguing between, I say we, my editorial associates and me. Is it going to be 200 pages? Is it going to be 450 pages? It looks like it's going to be like 350 to 400. Of, selected poems, I, I can easily make four volumes like that and still have stuff like, because I keep finding things. I found a lot of poems from, uh, several poems from 59 and 60 and 61 and 62. That's a long time ago. And they're, to me, as solid and as good and as fully expressive of going in as what I write today, which is saying a lot. It takes a lot of hubris to say that. But there's also a certain kind of humility, because then what kind of growth was there? You know, what did the years teach me? The years taught me that everything I learned, you know, when you're fortunate to have a good family, and basically, they didn't know I had ATD, Attention Deficit Disorder, but I never learned math, for example. Because like, I'm convinced now, because I couldn't see the blackboard, I could never see the formulas they were putting on the board. And so how was I going to learn it, you know? So I never went beyond basic math while all my friends did algebra, geometry, and all that. And, uh, you know, I just stayed with the writing. Uh, but, I, but I'll close this second question with that. Uh, a seventh grade science teacher said, don't worry about your grade. 
you just keep writing the poetry and I'll give you an A. <laughs> so he gave me a year's worth of A's and I, his name was Jack Carver. And he's in one of my books and I love that man so much. And he was probably about 40 then. You know, I always had this dream. He's still alive in his 90s in some rest home or something somewhere. You know, and I hope, I just hope he had a great life because he certainly, I believe he saved my ass in a certain way. Because I determined then that I wasn't going to be a professional. <clears throat> I wasn't going to go into any profession. I wasn't going to join the corporate world. It had less to do with politics than just with an intrinsic sense of what I am in the world for. I didn't feel I was in the world to make money. I certainly didn't feel I was in the world to, to be acquisitive in that sense. But you do want to survive, so I had to find ways to survive, and I found it great ways to survive. Forty years ago, I said to myself, I was driving out of Los Angeles, and I said, I'm going to meet an Asian doctor and live with him the rest of my life. And we met the next day. <laughs> and we've been together for 40 years, and he has literally provided me, just like Jack Carver, did provided me with like the Wizard of Oz Jack Harvard was, you know. Except when I pulled the veil back, it wasn't a guy from Kansas, it was a real wizard. But in, in, in Jesse's case, it was uh, it's somebody that uh, gave me the opportunity just to do my writing. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, I worked at New College of California for 12 years, pretty good income there. I sold my archive to the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, they have about 300 of my notebooks, half of which are, you can't read them, they're indecipherable. Uh, and I sell them a bill of goods. <laughs> and, uh, but, but in other words, I was able to provide some money and, hey, Jesse, I'm taking us to Europe. You know, or I, I've had a couple of readings in Europe and he always goes with me or, and, and, uh, and hey, they're gonna pay the hotel, blah, blah, blah. So there's all that too. But, but yes, that was, a, that was a magic moment. I have a few questions, and then I want to let you read a poem to close this out. I didn't want to forget that part. Um, could you talk about your first exposure to poetry and like the environmental influences or perhaps family influences to your earliest encounter with poetry? Well, I mentioned Humpty Dumpty. That's probably the first poem, and then I did fall three weeks later and I got a scar right here, a big scar, I was in the hospital and all that. And uh, once in front of the tree, I asked a very famous law professor who I knew very well and his wife. They lived right around the corner, right off of Broadway, this big esteemed professor at Berkeley. I said, sometimes David, I wish I was a scholar like you. And he said, well, you know, Neely, I wish I was a poet. When my children were young, I read them Humpty Dumpty, and you know how complex that poem is. You could spend a life interpreting it. Yeah, I think he was right, and uh, David was, was right, but... The next thing was probably The Raven by Poe. Of course, you probably know that. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary. You know, it's about the, the great raven that comes to the guy's door. Uh, that was a big influence on me. And these are things that rhymed. You know, it was rhyming things. And poetry was about rhyme to me, you know. And it still is in a way, but the rhyme is, the rhyme becomes very internalized. And you don't necessarily need it on the paper. It's, for one thing, it's a lot of hard work. I leave it to Bob Dylan to do that. He does it so beautifully. So, so um, that was it. In the moment, the moment I thought I, myself a poet was. It, and again, those of you who are writers, when does that happen? I, in my case, I was twelve. The first poem I wrote was about Buddha. Second poem I wrote was about Africa. And, you know, I, I'm having trouble remembering the third poem, but those are the 
two first poems. And the Buddha was interesting because I wrote it because in, in the Buddhist text, I found a non-dogmatic, meaning a non-God thing, a sense of, it was dogmatic only in the sense of that, that everything is suffering, which is what Buddha said, right? It's all about suffering. And how do you alleviate that? And that is by ending the need for recognition, ending your cravings and desires for what other people have, and, and not uh, looking for vengeance. I mean, that's the essence of Buddhism. And uh, now people have made a lot of money of that since, and there have been all kinds of interpretations of that since, but all these little kernels always had that, but I sort of stuck with that. That's the thing that kept me going. And it's ironic to me because my niece just wrote a book that Shambhala published, uh, luminous darkness. She's a Buddhist priest, and uh, her book is a. It's the one thing about poetry because it's not <coughs> practical. It's not useful. In, in a sense, in, in a certain sense, it's useless. What my niece did is a great book, but it's useful because it's a guidebook. It's like step one, step two, B. You do this, you do that. You learn how to meditate, and she tells you how to meditate. And uh, I've been trying to learn how to meditate for 77 years, and I'm just about ready. You know, when the, the guy offered me, the Roshi offered me to sit for two hours, I'm ready to do like 10 minutes in my garden. But that's taken decades. So anyway, there we are. For my uh, last question, and then you can read a poem. From all of your teaching experience over the years, you taught philosophy, literature, probably more subjects. Um, is there anything you can share about, as a teacher, um, some of those best moments? Just that the only thing I loved about teaching was, well, for one thing, I ran a private school, well, not for long, for about a, a year. I ran a, I had 12 to 16 year olds. I had about seven kids and I, rented space in a Christian church in San Bernardino. And I'm still in touch with some of the young students. And I just tried to prove to them that, that they weren't, they all had trouble in school. Prove to them that they weren't dumb. <laughs> you know, and that was enough. But my favorite teaching was with undergraduates. And, uh, and then I did a couple of, UC Berkeley Extension course, and I did one on Whitman and Dickinson. And, and then with the undergraduates, I did a course on Homer. And uh, that was wonderful because, you know, I gave them the idea that Homer is 2,500 years ago, but what Homer is doing is very modern writing. And, and, it's, and, and you, know, you know when you look at old art or old writing, it's, it's it has a contemporary feeling about it. It's, it's all about human emotions. And, Human emotions don't change. I don't think. I don't think they ever have. You know. I, and you know, to be a little, don't think that racism is a new thing. It's been around for a hundred thousand years, probably. You know. Which leads me to one last thing before I read a poem. Is I, I also I work from the idea that there's only one language, the human language, and I've been brought up with the idea and. And I live with the idea that there's only one race, the human race. And within that, there are variations. There's English, French, German, Latin, Chinese, Japanese, Hindi, uh, Sanskrit, there's all these other things, but it's the same thing. It's all the same thing. No, the Inuit don't have words for snow. I mean, for a, they, they don't have as many words for the sun or heat as they do in the South Islands. The South Islands are that any new word for snow, but they have words, for, but, but everything else is the same. You know, we need to eat, sleep, and uh, eat, and all those things, and uh, love, and hate, and uh, so that's what I work from, that, you know. That, that, that recent idea of, uh, of modernism, of appropriation, you know, how dare you write about my people? 
right? How dare you try to uh, express uh, racism if you're a white person or if you're this person or that person? And I say, how dare you not? You know? So anyway, that's, that's my last thing, and then I'll read a short thing. You may, yes. Oh. Okay, well. Whenever you're ready, yeah. Too much, because there's a lot already, see. I think I can find something. Okay. When a poet has a uh, audience, a captive audience, you don't want to run from it, right? <laughs> you know, it, poets always, uh, I had people over for lunch today, my, mostly poets, and my inclination was that, now, then I thought it was corny, was to have everybody read a poem, but then I thought, ah, well, that's a little bit corny. This is the latest poem I wrote, and this will be the end of it. It's not that long. I wrote this this morning. I invented a country where old men never grow old. They build great aviaries in the highlands and fill them with birds. These men have the rugged trails in their hearts. I love this country because the sun is a pinwheel and the anger men feel turns to driftwood. Smoothed by ocean waves. How could this fear of death exist in such a place? All this brittleness vanishes. I came upon an ancient abbey and wandered among the ruins. The monks who lived here worked in a vast library copying beautiful script. In this country I do cartwheels. At the medical center they gave me a clean bill of health. They know how determined I am to exercise and eat well. Oh, one road I came across sheep crossing from meadow to meadow a small black dog kept them in line. In the late evening, I took a turn at a road and found an inn, took a room and ate dinner in a cozy dining room. I had roast chicken and drank wine. Byzantine music animated my thoughts. At this aviary, I built a brook of fast running water and constructed a waterfall, sparkling water. Lovebirds sat on my right shoulder. Birds of paradise walked onto the air. Eucalyptus grew profusely. This is a country where old men are advised not to grow old. They don't need to dye their hair or worry about funeral expenses. They proceed to the harbor where a coffee cart is open for business and we may smile as the boat passes leaving trails of water on the surface of the sea. There you go. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Neely. We'll take a five minute intermission and come back for Tongues of Heaven, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody help you get down here? Anybody want books? <laughs>